For the next panel, we are happy to have um, Blake Evans from Georgia. We have Mandy Grandjean from Ohio as state election officials. We have Ricky Hatch, who's the clerk auditor in uh, Weber County, Utah. And then we have Pam Fessler, who's the former correspondent for the National Public Radio and a consultant with the Elections Group. Well, welcome everybody. Um, I really appreciate um, being invited here and that having this opportunity to talk about a topic that I know everybody in this room uh, knows is crucial, and that is good, effective communication, um, now more than ever. And as we heard from the last panel, that certainly is something a lot of communities and states have already been working on. Um, we, unlike the other panels, have no slides, so you have to just look at us. <laughs> We're hoping to make this as much a conversation as possible about um, the challenges that people are facing and some of the examples of things that people have done in, in, in trying to address communication challenges over the past few years uh, that might be helpful um, and things that they've learned um, that might be helpful for other communities. And um, you know, one of the things that I did, I, I just retired from NPR last year and decided, you know, I, 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 I felt so strongly after covering elections for 20 years um, about how terrible it was that so much disinformation was spread and that public confidence in elections had declined so dramatically for, for, for no reason when after having uh, a nation that had conducted probably one of the most successful elections ever uh, during a pandemic. Uh, I went around and asked people, well, wh what could I do? How could I help? And one of the things people said was that there, there was really this desire to figure out what were the best ways to communicate with the public, not only to educate them, but also to um, fight in disinformation, but also to instill more confidence and to make people once more trust elections. And so uh, working with the elections group, I wrote um, a guide called Telling Our Story, which uh, Amy will admit she stole the title for this panel. Um, and m m there were tips in there. We have lots of tips in there about some things that, that might help in working with the media um, and, and, and um, fighting disinformation. But a lot of it was pulling together examples of things that are already going on in states and local communities around the country in the hopes that some of these best practices uh, might help that, you know, as, as the last panel talked about, coordinating, working together, that we're all in this together. Um, how can we figure out the best way to, to um, fight something that clearly is not going away? So today, fortunately, we are, um, uh, we have both uh, uh, Ricky, Mandy, and uh, Blake here to talk, which I thought kind of sounded like a, a 1970s folk rock group or something. Um, anyway, and they all have had really um, s some very big challenges um, over the last few years to talk about some of their experiences, what they did, how they met those challenges, and then you know what worked and what didn't work. And as much as possible, we want to make this a conversation and leave as much time for, uh, as possible for you to also make suggestions and comments and maybe and to ask questions. So I'm going to start first with Blake, uh, who I would say was uh, in, in in ground zero in 2020, except Maricopa County might be a little upset or, to <laughs> or take some issue with that. And, and you obviously had so to deal with so much disinformation and um, confusion um, in 2020 about the election and the results and the counting of the votes. So maybe can you talk a little bit about how you met those challenges? How did you, um, you know, what were some of the new challenges that you faced and how did you rest and what worked and what didn't? So I think, you know, when we talk about election results, um, there are a couple different buckets to kind of put the conversation in. And one is about, you know, the results themselves, so the, the actual vote totals that candidates get. And then the other bucket is about kind of the communication that you put around those. How do you explain to people um, the, the processes that counties go through, that jurisdictions go through to be able to report results? How do you explain to people the, the timing uh, in, in reporting results. And, and so I think those are 
two kind of important categories to group the conversation in. But I mean, I mean, when it comes to election results, it's really pretty simple. People want accuracy, speed, transparency, and they want their candidate to win. As long as you got those people, we'll be happy. And you know, if uh, unfortunately, uh, usually by that you know kind of formula, there's going to be slightly less than half of the population in a close contest that's not going to be very happy with the way the results come out. Um, and to put myself back in the shoes, Mandy was just saying, and I do agree with her, kind of reflecting and pre preparing for what I would say, it did bring back some PTSD a little bit. Um, but to think back to November 2020 and what was going on, that was my first uh, major election uh, working in the Secretary of State's office. I, I joined the Secretary of State's office uh, in the middle of 2020 and uh, as deputy director for Chris Harvey, who was awesome to work for, uh, I came from just down the street. Uh, before that, I was working with Fulton County elections. And then before that, I was working in Escambia County, Florida for David Stafford, who many of you know. So I've, I've seen a few things, um, but this was, um, th th this was different. So this is my first major election uh, in November 2020 with the Secretary of State's office. So I was learning the team. I was learning the election day processes. Um, we had a great war room set up, <clears throat> and uh, and it was a it was a very smooth day. Uh, just to give some context about uh, voting in in Georgia and what we were looking like in November, um, you know, it, obviously it was very different because of COVID. We had 1.3 million absentee ballots that were cast in that election, that made up about 26 percent of the total number of ballots cast in the election. So 26%, and what our counties are normally used to in processing absentee ballots is to have those make up about 5% uh, of the ballots cast. And this was also the first election cycle uh, that Georgia counties were using uh, paper ballots in a very, very long time because they were used to DREs. And so they were, they were running elections with different equipment for the very first time, and, uh, and, and they were running elections differently and, and counting, you know, more absentee ballots for the very first time than what they ever had. And any time that you do things for the first time, you're going to, to learn lessons that you can apply uh, later on, but, you know, you live and learn. And so, so, so on election night, uh, results began to, uh, to come in. Our uh, advanced voting numbers were reported very quickly. Um, absentee numbers uh, in, in most counties were, were reported um, fairly quickly, although we did have a lot of absentee ballots that came in um, close to the polls closed, 7 p.m. Um, and um, we, we did, and, and that, with emergency rule, we were able to allow counties for the very first time to begin processing absentee ballots two weeks ahead of time, which was a very good thing that allowed, um, that allowed a lot of counties to, to be able to report absentee results very quickly. Um, a handful of counties, probably admittedly, because it was the first time, did learn some lessons um, that they could apply later on to allow them to report the results a little bit faster than, than they did uh, in November. Um, but, but we did have that two weeks of early processing that's now codified in our law uh, based on legislation from 2021. Um, but uh, results began to come in. Advanced voting was reported pretty quickly. Election day results would be reported that night. And so what we were left with at the end of election night in November was um, a relatively small in terms of percentage number of absentee ballots that were still outstanding, still trying to be counted. And, uh, and then uh, just over 11,000, I believe it was 11,300 or so uh, provisional ballots that, that would be cast. And so we, you know, we're trying to, fortunately, I'm, I'm very grateful to, to work with um, a very good communications team. Um, and we, you know, in, in talking with them and talking with folks like Gabriel Sterling, who did a lot of the press for, for our office, what we try to do is just be very, very um, frequent with putting out facts and with updating people and just being very, very transparent with what was going on. Uh, and if, you know, some, a question came up or a mistake came up, you know, correcting it as soon as possible and being extremely honest and transparent with the process to let people know uh, what was going on. And so, 
Um, you know, this, like I said, this was my first election working with the team. And so I was, uh, we, we had our war room set up with, uh, with a lot of folks there. Um, G Gabe and I were, were working real closely together. He would, he would ask me for, for data uh, that he would use in, in an interview to be able to let people know how many ballots were outstanding. Um, we were, we had folks constantly on the phone with counties asking them, okay, you know, what's your absentee situation look, looking like? How many absentees did you have come in at the last minute? Um, and, and how many do you still have to process before they're included in the results? Um, and so that, that continued. I remember on Wednesday morning, um, we continued to get requests as, as the results began to, because when we went home at 2 or 3 a.m. or whenever it was to get a few hours of sleep, um, President Trump still held the, the lead um, by, by uh, by a few thousand votes, I guess it was, and uh, but we were getting questions about, okay, how many UACAVA do you have outstanding? How many absentee ballots do you have outstanding? And so we, we continued with those those frequent press conferences throughout the day on Wednesday and and in the, the days and, and weeks following the election. Um, and uh, just kind of to, to wrap up my, my opening um, comments, uh, you know, we, we, we did, you know, I, I learned a lot uh, kind of in, in working with Gay, working with our public information team. I, I think, um, you know, it's uh, one of the things I wish I, I had done a little bit differently was try to anticipate um, the kind of the data that they were going to need uh, kind of b before election night. Uh, we were, we've learned in the time since then to have a team that's been uh, set up and uh, ready to, uh, or proactively running reports uh, out of our voter registration system about, you know, okay, how many throughout the day on election day, how many absentee ballots have we accepted um, that may not be included in the initial results and that, that kind of thing. But um, yeah, so that's kind of at least for election day itself and kind of the, you know, 24 hours following um, what we were what we were doing. Yeah, and, and actually when, when I was putting together my guide and talking about um, to, to uh, people in Georgia, one of the things that reporters commented on was how great it was that you guys had these news conferences constantly um, and basically um, sometimes several times a day, right? And, and you know, just answered every single question. But it's interesting but talking about having the data available ahead of time. Um, Mandy, um, why don't you, so you are not only, uh, you, you have a challenge now, or you have had a challenge this year because of all of the uncertainty because of redistricting. Uh, can you talk about, um, you know, how you have dealt with trying to communicate the, all of this uncertainty, to, especially to the public? Um, and and have you, there, are there things that you're learning as you're doing this? Yeah, thanks, Sam. I think um, I'm going to start sort of my opening remarks with a question back to you. It's really a six-part question back to you. Um, and uh -oh. then I'm going to uh, set parts. the stage for the audience um, for what, what Pam is actually referring to in, in, in case, you know, I saw a tweet just yesterday that said, has anybody tried to unplug Ohio and plug it back in? Yeah, I saw that. And, you know, I said, I've tried. I really have. I really have tried. Um, but, you know, so my, my question is, how do you communicate the unknowns, the chaos, an extremely complex set of legal issues to stakeholders and particularly the stakeholders that, one, are responsible for administering elections, the stakeholders, two, the voters, three, to those who are running for election, four, to the lawmakers who control any changes to state law, five, to the courts who will ultimately determine your destiny, and six to your therapist who is like, are you alive? What is going on? <laughs> so that's my six part question back to you. Um, you know, I, I guess I just want to at the highest level, I'm going to speak as fast as I can because this has been, I, I was jokingly telling someone this may or may not be a very nerdy Netflix documentary at some point. I mean, I really hope it isn't because even just drafting this notes that was traumatic in and of itself. Um, but, you know, setting the stage back to 
what am I talking about? I'm talking about redistricting in the state of Ohio and I'm, and I'm talking about the process. And, you know, several years ago, um, we passed a constitutional amendment in the state of Ohio um, by direct democracy, meaning, you know, voters voted on a constitutional amendment to reform how we do redistricting. So this was a novel, you know, new constitutional amendment that was being set, put in place for the first time. And no one really knew how that was going to go, right? Because no one had actually drawn lines or maps or anything like that with this new, this new commission, which was made up of legislatures um, and uh, state constitutional offices, including the Secretary of State. And... You know, of course, all of you know, we got the data late, right? We got the data late from the census, and we've all heard this a million times over, and, and yada, yada, yada. And we all have different redistricting processes, just like we have different election processes. So ultimately, way back in September of 2021, we landed with our first set of maps in Ohio for, for congressional and state house. And so this is important because what I'm going to be talking about is, you know, two, two or three, really three very complex set of um, maps. So we have state house, which is in Ohio, the state the the state house and the state senate, so the general assembly. What corresponds with the general assembly is the state central committee districts as well. Um, so which is like the political parties governing bodies that corresponds with those maps. And then we also have congressional maps. And in Ohio, we lost um, an electoral, so we went down. So from an apportionment perspective, we, we knew that there had to be changes there due to, due to the census. Um, so our first set of maps came in September of 21. And then there was nothing until January 12th when uh, our Supreme Court invalidated our first state house map. On January 14th, our con first, the first congressional uh, map went went uh, down as well by that same court. On January 19th, I found out I was pregnant. So while I was going through <laughs> this insane personal uh, or per per this per insane per personal time, I was also going through professional hell. Um, on, on January 22nd, uh, there was a new state house map passed. On January 28th, there was a bill that ca was passed and signed by the governor that categorically changed the way that elections um, are done, the petition process is done in the state of Ohio to account for the various different maps. Um, on the 24th, a third map was passed. On March 2nd, a second congressional map was passed. On March 9th, we had to issue a new form of the ballot. By the way, our primary is May 3rd, I'm getting there. Um, on March 10th, um, because I am now at this point screaming that, you know, there's no way that, you know, we're going to meet the UACAVA deadline because we still have no idea what's on the ballot. Um, and if anybody here has had to seek a UACAVA waiver, let's chat about that process. Um, so <laughs> that was fun. Um, on March 10th, there ultimately was a bill passed um, and signed by the governor that, again, categorically changed how we send UACOM ballots. And um, I have 88 counties. I mean, we're decentralized. You know, you heard Megan talk about we're decentralized. And how am I communicating everything that I'm trying to explain to you guys, to them, and to all of those other stakeholders that I just, that I just talked about? Um, by the way, while all of this is going – there's probably 14 different pieces of litigation going on that will ultimately determine this. March 23rd, you know, we have to strip the state house and the state central committee from the ballot. Literally, like we have to remove them from the ballot because there are no districts. Um, on March 30, there is a decision from federal court that gives some sort of certainty. And by that time, we are already in early voting for the May 3rd. We have about 28 days of early voting in the state of Ohio. So how do you talk about that, Pam? Well, bless, <laughs> no, I get to ask the questions. <laughs> no, really, I mean, how do you, I mean, if I'm a voter in, in Ohio, I am, I, I can't imagine not being totally confused and still confused. So what did you do to, to try and get that message across, and, and also to make sure that they felt confident that things were in good hands. It, you know, that's right. And I think, you know, Blake said a, a point that we, we tried to emulate 
is describe things as factually as you possibly can. Um, and first and foremost, I had to still administer this election, right? Like, and so I had to draft, we, we have directives in the state of Ohio, which, you know, have the force of law, which are binding on the boards of elections to tell them what to do. Right. Essentially, we issued 15 directives. I basically wrote a law textbook, um, over the last eight months. And that was the basis for what we used. I mean, and that was interpreting things and you know, the legal standard is a reasonable interpretation of election law or a court decision or a bill or, or what have you. And a lot of times, you know, we don't know. I mean, all of this is so novel. You, you know, no one has ever been in this position before. Um, and so we're trying to the best of our ability to, to create this very formal framework of instructions for the boards of elections. Me then trying my hardest to explain that because this is, I mean, very high level legal analysis at this point to, to explain this to our communications team right. who is trying to translate, you know, a foreign language to voters who are then trying to determine what's, and, and this is all changing within days, constantly changing. And, and, and so do you, do, you, do you, is it basically up to the um, counties or the, the local communities to actually do the communication with the public and that you're, you're giving them the information and they provide it or? It was a joint effort, um, candidly. Like, so we wanted to make sure that the boards were armed with the facts. Right. Like, this is how we're going to administer the election. This is what is on the ballot. This is what, you know, this new law requires us to do. And we knew that, I mean, all of you experienced this in 2022 who have this decentralized system, they, voters would rather trust their local bipartisan election officials than the state, right? They, right. they have personal relationships with them. And so when, you know, the board of elections is telling a voter, hey, this is what we just got from the secretary of state's office. We're trying to understand it, but this is what we think it means that goes a lot farther than them calling our office and getting, you know, a constituent. And we, we still did a ton of constituent outreach right. and, and answering questions, but we really tried to emphasize to our locals, communicate. But part of my six prong question was we had to hit the candidates too, right. because the candidates were the ones that were also communicating with voters, right? And so if the candidates didn't know what was going on, which they didn't, you know, the voters were just going to continue to get confused because um, right. the candidates would go, you know, door to door saying, I'm on the May 3rd, 2022 primary election. Well, no, 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 you're not, you know, or I mean, and you guys like it fundamentally coming down to the to the wire of I don't even know what district I'm running in. So, you know, we would do calls with um anyone who was willing to be to be on the calls we had calls with the congressional delegations we had calls with you know the leaderships um in the general assembly from both sides of the aisle to just explain factually and then just get our directive out because i mean stripping as much of the flower away from it as possible and sticking primarily to the facts um because this was when i say and, and still is just yesterday our obviously our our another congressional map went down that everyone was just elected on in May. It's a whole nother conversation. Um, but you know, you have to just stick with as close to the law and, and the facts as, as humanly possible because it was just so contentious. Um, well, thank you for that, um, and we'll talk. We can talk more about it. But, but I'd love to hear from uh, Ricky, who um, you know, obviously you are um, dealing with this local. You're you're in the the, the, the county office, and um, I was interested actually when I was working on the um, on on the guide that there were so many examples. I was trying to find all these examples of people really doing innovative things and trying to reach out to voters in this, uh, you weren't dealing with a specific crisis, but just sort of in a day-to-day, -day, how do you uh, build confidence and, um, 
and, and bring it, the voters in and educate them. And you guys were doing some really interesting things. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, no specific crisis, just prolonged trauma. Yeah, all. right, right, right. <laughs> I mean, with the, the, there's a national crisis. That's right. Um, it all boils down for us, primarily our social media um, process uh, boils down to, boiled down to uh, cats and Legos. Um, that set the base, and it sounds really silly, but uh, in reality, our social media person uh, loves cats. Our whole elections office loves cats for some reason, and uh, loves Legos. And so she does most of our memes are based off of that, and that brings in a certain crowd that may not necessarily be super interested in elections, but it hooks them in and gets them in, and and it really established kind of a base for the remainder of uh, of our program. Um, so that was that's the social media side. The other thing that I think is really important is quick response to media. And I learned this from Neil Kelly a few years back. Um, uh, you know, we love to hate reporters. Sorry, Pam. <clears throat> <laughs> we like to complain about them, but if we ignore them, they're our worst enemy. If we work with them, they can be our best ally. Um, and we've got nothing to hide, so why not work with them? And I remember uh, on very busy days down at the Capitol, standing in the hallway, talking with the reporter and thinking, I am wasting my time explaining this minutia. And then it turns out this reporter has been one of our best allies as far as getting the message out. Uh, and so that was a, an hour very well spent. Um, uh, our office, you know, I, I wouldn't say we've done anything all that creative. We created a few, uh, some cartoons, some short cartoons or some short videos. Our county's not huge. It's, uh, we have 260,000 people. Um, it's not small, but it's not huge. We're, my elections office has four full-time staff. Um, we would occasionally issue a press release, but we didn't really have a really good, strong communications plan. Uh, and then 2020 ha uh, hit, and in, in May of 21, I just had this nagging feeling that this, isn't, this criticism isn't going away. It's getting worse and it's gonna start manifesting itself in our legislature and they're gonna start passing laws that are based off of crap. They're based off of unfounded information uh, and allegations. And I thought we need to go on the offensive. We need to, as, as election officials, as local election officials, we need to work with the state and, and proactively go out and, and proselyte the truth. We need to, to get that out there. Um, and that kind of turned into a communications plan. I, I thought, our original thought was, we gotta cr prevent crazy legislation, but it really turned into a, a public outreach effort. Um, and I'll, I'll just briefly talk about what we did. So I'm a CPA uh, in the other part of my job, and so I, I wanted to look at the election process through the eyes of a CPA. What are the key risks in every step of the process, and what are the key controls or safeguards that address those key risks. Um, and so we, we started putting that together. We came back with a five page comprehensive document that lists those. I was thinking spreadsheet, but fortunately we hired a firm that uh, made it look pretty uh, and not like it was done by, a, by an accountant. Um, and it's a five page comprehensive document. Then that, we then took that to the state elections office and the lieutenant governor and said, we want you to sign on to this. And we, we made some changes and adjustments and came up with a great document that we unveiled in October of 2021 at a state legislative hearing um, in front of about 400 angry citizens who were, wanted to repeal 2020 and uh, all sorts of stuff. Um, so we unlaid, uh, that's when we unveiled it. We then gave copies of this to every legislator we could find. We emailed them. We handed them out during the legislative session. Uh, we handed them out to um, voters uh, and citizens who came through for tours. Anybody who walked into our office left with one of those documents. We gave them to reporters and we thought that was really important. But the five page documents, kind of heavy. It's a lot of stuff. And so uh, our county boiled it down into a one page trifold. It comes up with four pillars of election administration and then talks about each of those pillars. Um, and, and so it, it, we boiled it down to a, a single page that we could very easily explain within just a few minutes and hand it, and that is what we began also handing out to people. 
We contacted reporters pretty regularly. We offered tours, election integrity tours, we called them. Uh, and counties through, throughout the state started doing this. One night a month, you come, no questions are off limits. We'll walk you through the process, usually involved a, a PowerPoint kind of sit down explanation. And then we'd go in and look at the equipment. Um, during the primary election in June, we just filmed a series of 12 one minute videos that have no spoken words. It's just me standing there with cue cards that explain, we show the people processing, the, the election judges and the uh, workers processing the ballots in the background. And I'm explaining on the, on the cards in one sentence um, chunks, here's what they're doing, here's the control, and then we put a little hashtag that's gonna appear on that. We haven't finished those videos yet. But uh, we, we've done that, and uh, they, they just talk about the highlights, um, the, the processes, and the safeguards that are in place. And it always starts with the cue, first cue card says, shh, election professionals at work. Um, and uh, we'll see how that, how that goes. But the idea is small chunks that can be easily digested uh, and hopefully a little bit fun to share. So I'm actually curious, uh, uh, so I, I know you were having a lot of these tours, bringing a lot of voters in, and, and what I was especially struck by, there will answer any question, there's no question, you know, that's off, and, and you did the same, you guys did the same thing in Georgia too, we'll just keep answering the questions. Um, so how effective was that? I mean, do you really think that it, 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 it has made a difference because obviously a lot of election officials are confronted with groups of people you can keep answering their questions and it just does not seem to make a difference but do you think it did it's effective on two levels and i, I have my cynical hat that i'll just take off for a minute um, we had press releases we had uh, tv um, spots that were done on this it was in the paper um, and we thought we'd have 200 people there. We had seven. And three of them were poll workers. Um, and the other three were election deniers. And so uh, it was pretty disappointing. But it's kind of like the starfish story, you know, throw the starfish into the ocean to save them, what well, matters to that one. And you kind of have to think about it that way. It's even, even if we have just one person who's convinced they will talk to their neighbors. Um, they will uh, hopefully uh, share their experience when, they're, when others challenge the process. And we do the same thing for uh, candidates, and that's been far more effective that we bring the candidates and the party leadership in and, and give them a tour as well. Uh, but then the other, the other benefit from that is simply the fact that we're having it. I had several people come up and say, uh, the mere, I knew the mere fact that you have, you open up your office to these tours and you let anybody come in and you say no questions, the mere fact that you're saying that gives me trust in the elections process. Mm -hmm. So that's a nice little bonus, but we were hoping, we'd love to have 50, 100 people every time. And, and how about you, Blake? I mean, I'm just curious, do you feel like it was, you know, this, this, this policy or strategy of really just keep answering all the questions, providing data, was that the most effective way to deal with all of the, not only confusion, but also the conspiracy theories that you were being confronted with constantly? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd hate to imagine, to imagine a world where we didn't. Um, you know, I think it was one of the most effective ways. We had a platform in that moment in time to be able to hold those press conferences, and, uh, and, and Gabe or, or Secretary Raffensperger went out there every time and, and continued to whatever the you know, the, the conspiracy theory of the day was to address it head on. And, uh, and then not only that, but we did in another platform, we, we had a website, secure, securevoteGA.com, um, where we uh, specifically addressed several conspiracy theories and put evidence on there as in, in written explanations about, you know, here's the theory and this is why, or, or here's, the, here's the truth. I mean, everybody knows about the... Um, you know Fulton County videos at State Farm Arena of putting, oh, suitcases. yeah, putting putting ballots under the table in, in ballot containers and sealing them and then taking them back out and unsealing them and follow following proper procedures. Um, those videos are on there uh, with written explanations about you know here's what actually occurred and so I think um, you know you're 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 not going to win over everybody but you're going to win over somebody. And, and, and usually it's more than one somebody. 
Um, so, and it's the right thing to do. I mean, it's the right thing to do to, to let um, folks that, uh, uh, that are confused um, to set the record straight and then to also show people that, uh, that are on your side that you're going to continue to fight the good fight. Um, so, so I'm also curious, you know, if we can talk a little bit about, you know, looking forward. If you have one piece of advice, communication advice, not only for other states, but also local communities, you know, many of whom are under-resourced, you know, what is the, the one or two things that they can do that you think might be the m most effective at, at Mostly, I would say, building public confidence, because I think that that's probably the biggest uh, threat. Do you want to go ahead? Uh, I, I would say be proactive, be creative, be okay to be a little bit uncomfortable. And uh, What do you mean by that? I always worry that I'm going to say something really stupid <laughs> right. all the time. Anytime I do a live interview especially, I'm just really worried that I'm going to say do some big gaffe. Um, or that I'm gonna get a fact wrong or you know something like that. So I'm just always worried. Um, but I keep saying, I can't let that stop me from at least trying. You gotta get it out there. And, and that goes along with the last thought, which is you can't let perfect be the enemy of good. Uh, I wanted to do these videos. I wanted a nice, clean, big production. We didn't have the budget for that. So we filmed them with an iPhone and they'll be kind of home, kind of folksy and that's okay. Yeah, no, I think that actually I think that's great because you're, what you're trying to do also is get across this message that elections are run, you know, as we say, you know, by your friends, by your neighbors, your human beings. I mean, they're not perfect necessarily, but they're generally really, really good. And sometimes, you know, just taking your phone and just doing a little video around the office, I mean, that does connect. You're trying to connect with people. And so I think that's a really good point. I would say, I mean, my stakeholder, like my situation's different than the right. You have si a very situation, unique thing going on right um, now. Yeah. that that Blake and um, Ricky are talking about. But you know, what I had to, what was a you know a real personal growth moment for me was realizing that no one actually knows what I'm talking about. Right. <laughs> um, and and. <laughs> You know, whether that is, you know, and, and I say this with all due respect, I mean, you can look at my transcripts if you really want to, because I said that a million times, but slowing down and explaining to, you know, three federal judges how elections work right. and, 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 and trying to communicate to them how important this decision that they were about to make was for our democracy and you know, the intricacies of a bottom-up voter registration system, the intricacies of why I don't have a metaphorical button to just reset an election with all new candidates and all new maps. I mean, and I know that sounds maybe condescending to some of us in here, but but I, I had to really check myself and say, no, Mandy, these people don't, they don't have any idea what you're talking about. And you have to slow down and try your hardest to factually explain how our, our our democracy at the very technical level works. And I had to do that with the state legislature. I had to do that with our, you know, I mean, obviously our local election officials understand, but I had to also slow down and say, this is what the litigation, this is what's going on with the litigation. And so there was this very like strict, you know, method of patience that I had to attempt to have while I'm also internally freaking out because how are we going to do all of these things? Um, and simultaneously being really an empathetic ear toward to our local election officials who are suffering, right? I mean, right. who are really suffering and they're mad at me because I'm the messenger and they're mad at everybody. And that's fair, right? Like as a, at a human reaction level, that is very fair. They just survived 2020 and now they're in something that's 10 times worse. Um, and leveling with them and saying, guys, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't have all the answers. I wish I did. But once I do get answers and I can communicate that to you, my promise is I will as soon as possible. And I will be there with you every step of the way to advocate for what you need to get this job done. Um, 
Yeah, and I, and I think that's a good point. And, and, and Ricky talked about this too a little bit. Just, you know, you really have to make the messages concise, focused, directed, because, you know, obviously you guys all understand this incredibly complicated process. But most people don't, you know, and certainly the public doesn't, you know, and why it's so, so important. And I, um, so Blake, how about anything else that you can think of as, you know, you know, hopefully other states will not face what you faced in 2020, but somebody probably will. I mean, is, is there some lesson that you learned from 2020 that you think is very important to uh, convey? Yeah, I think it's I think it's very important now more than ever to make sure that we're thinking about ways uh, to communicate parts of the process um, that are that are built into the process that are that are really good parts and that um, are opportunities to uh, allow our different stakeholders to really begin to understand the process because it is one that that a lot of people don't know much about and kind of like Ricky mentioned earlier, there's there are some things built into the process that we do that add a lot of value. Um, that uh, that even if there aren't a lot of people that show up, uh, it's important that we do them because then we we have them to to be able to reference like like logic and accuracy testing, you know testing our equipment. A lot, well, counties we've encouraged counties you know make sure that you're that you're advertising those, uh, make sure that you're letting your political parties know about those so that people have the opportunity to show up. And a lot of times nobody shows up or one or two people will show up for you know, 15 minutes, but you can say that you did it and then you can encourage to, uh, you know, if somebody doubts the system, if somebody, um, you know, ha has concerns, um, make sure that you're pushing those things out. Same thing with poll watchers, you know, po poll watchers can be a very good tool if, when well trained. Um, so make sure that you're taking the time to be able to describe the process and what they're seeing to them. And, and also with, with legislators, like Mandy uh, mentioned, um, you know, we, we had a, some significant law changes in 2021. Um, and I, I noticed there were on uh, many occasions in speaking with local election officials, uh, there were times when feedback would be provided of, you know, oh, I, I don't, I don't like that. And I've told my, my local legislator that I, that I don't like that. And I think what we need to get in the habit of doing is, okay, you may have told them you didn't like it, but did you engage them in a dialogue about what it is that they're trying to achieve? Because sometimes they, they think that the solution that they're putting forward is the best solution because they may not completely understand the process. But if you actually understand their, their goal or what they're trying to achieve, you, you might be able to help them understand the big picture and you might be able to collectively um, you know, collaborate on a piece of legislation that, uh, that, that is much more productive to voters who are concerned, who have concerns about the process, to, to legislators and to local election officials. Yeah, and I think that's another point is that, um, and, and you've all kind of touched on it, is that you're not communicating these messages. You, you, the, the burden shouldn't just be on the local election officials or the state election officials to communicate these messages. You need to bring on um, um, allies, whether it's lawmakers, members of the public, members of the media, um, people in their local communities who can basically also tell them, as it, hey, I saw that this, this is how the system works. It actually works really well. And that's what, you know, one of the things I, I noticed a lot was, um, you know, people, I don't, I'm not sure if it was just Weber County, but um, a lot of local election offices would bring in and have these tours, and maybe three people would show up, but be, there'd be a newspaper, uh, there'd be a, a story on the local news that maybe, you know, 30,000 people saw. Um, and so it would have that um, um, bigger effect. Um, I'd like to open it up for um, any uh, comments or discussion or questions that anybody might have um, of the panelists about either challenges that you faced or things that you have found that work really well and that you think could actually uh, be of use for other communities and states. Hi, I have that something. Oh, sorry. Whoever was talking. Uh, I have a quick comment, uh, and that is that I think uh, Gabe Sterling, Brad Raffensperger, Steve Ricker, um, Megan Wolf, 
uh, basically have saved democracy in this country in this last election, and I just want you to recognize that. Well, I guess we should end here then. <laughs> well, okay. uh, Karen Sellers, Kentucky. <clears throat> I was yesterday. I didn't get here till last night because. Our state and local, uh, um, our state and local government interim joint committee of the Kentucky Legislature met yesterday, and I have to shout out to our chairman because his goal was to try to educate about election integrity in Kentucky. He had our two certified election equipment uh, vendors come to the meeting, set up their equipment. Uh, had us testify to that, had the vendors testify to the accuracy, logic, and election integrity that we go through each day, more or less, as part of State Board of Elections and the county clerks. I have to shout out to them because that was probably one of the best attended interim committee meetings I've ever seen. Great questions. I believe they were truly engaged. Um, understood the vendors uh, were they were very well received now not that we didn't have a couple of election deniers on the paint on the committee but they did a great job and more or less shut them down a little bit and those are recorded uh, the public can watch it and I really feel like if all the legislatures would do that and have it demonstrated. I mean, most of our legislature has never seen the demonstration of the election equipment unless they just go vote, but yeah. truly the whole process. Yeah, and that seems to be the case lots of places. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, other comments? Questions? Mine is, um, for the most part a comment which is that that was very good thank you guys it's like really impressive what all three of you are are doing in this regard and it, i know it's a panel's good like that when i i just i kept having questions and you kept answering them as me, immediately when i thought of them um and just how many times i can relate to exactly what what you guys are saying and um just one example mandy when you were saying um at one point just being straightforward and honest with your locals and other folks that you weren't sure what was going to happen that i don't know what's going to happen um i just think that a central theme to your panel and to what we do and what we should be doing going forward is being honest um being humble and being empathetic with sort of at all levels with the people we deal with especially our, our local election administrators but also voters and candidates and legislators um so thank you guys um, thank, thank you. Um, I, I guess one thing I'd like to talk about too a little bit is just resources. You know, obviously, you know, you, uh, Ricky, you, you talk about what your communications program was. You know, do, how much does that cost? I mean, are there things that people can do that are not going to cost a lot of money or take a lot of personnel? You know, what, what are the most effective things to do at the lowest cost? Uh, our social media program it takes about one-fourth of one employee's time. She's just really good at it, um, and so she does a good job, and she schedules during the downtime is when she does most of the work, and then the rest during the busy time. I mean, she posts five to six times a day in the slow time, and then during elections, it's 12 to 15 posts a day on three different platforms, um, but it's only a, a, a quarter FTE. Our, our uh, annual budget for kind of voter outreach type stuff is $7,000, mm -hmm. and uh, We've never exceeded that, and we probably should uh, should try to do that more. But it's it's really just a mindset um, and setting aside some time to really say, okay, what what kind of message do we want to get out there, and what are the what are the avenues that we can use to to get that message out there, and then leveraging our advocates. We spent right after 2020, uh, in December of 2020, our new congressman that got elected in 2020, we invited him in for a tour personal tour of our elections office. He was there three hours, came back in, in three weeks for another three hours, and he's been one of our biggest advocates um, 
federally as well as locally when people challenge him he said you know i he says i understand the process i've walked through it Mo i spent hours there and asked hard questions he says we've got a good system and that just pays thousands um, of dividends a little you know unrelated to redistricting but you know just in the same theme of um these two's comments you know, I think the biggest thing is that it is very, very, very inexpensive to have a conversation. Right. And it might be a really uncomfortable conversation. You know, I, again, that note of just taking a step back and, and, and really realizing that these people do not understand and then saying, you know, you might hate my guts. You might think that I've done everything wrong, but I'm going to bring you in. I'm going to explain this process to you. I'm going to hope that we're both operating in good faith and that, you know, you want to learn and I want to give you, you know, factual information. I mean, that's part of public service, right? right. I mean, that really is. And so I think it's hard, right? It's a very human reaction to be defensive and want to close down and not want, want to be open and want to view the world as very much them versus us, right? Those who get it and those who don't. Um, but I think, you know, even though we're in this state of great fatigue, great, great attrition and retention issues in the election space, you know, we, I think a big theme that I've been talking to my colleagues about is, is if it's not us having these conversations, then who, right. who will have them? And that's part of, I think, keeping democracy alive is not shutting your doors inviting the hard conversation in um, and, and humbling yourself, you know, to the mission of I explaining how things work. I mean, that's one of the reasons where we called it telling our story. You know, it was a good, we initially was going to be telling your story. We we're like, no, it's our story. It's everybody's story. I mean, we have this amazing election assistance, you know, that a system that we want to work, want to work well. And it, it, it's communicating that. Um, Blake, do you want to? Yeah, so I mean, I, I remember Gabe when he had a thousand followers on Twitter, and now he has like yeah. 70, 80,000. So just figure out a way to go viral, and you'll get a bunch of followers. Um, That's but. Not it, <laughs> Yeah, a good way to go viral. Uh, so, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, as far as resources, I mean, like like I mentioned earlier, uh, it's really, the, you know, we have we have the website uh, that we put out um, information about, you know, conspiracy theories. But then other, I mean, other than that, it's really just, we do utilize some social media, which is, you know, free. And then it doesn't, as Mandy said, doesn't cost any any money to have a conversation. And so that's what we've been trying to do. Well, and I think the other thing is also, um, you, you talked a little bit about working with the media, too. I mean, uh, 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 that obviously involves personnel, but, um, you, you know, good coverage is free, right? Yeah. I mean. Yeah, absolutely. Maintaining a good, you know, relationship with your, uh, especially your, your local media uh, has been, been extremely helpful uh, for us. And we've been fortunate to have a good, a good comms team uh, led by, you know, Gabe and, and our Deputy Secretary, Jordan Fuchs. And, and uh, so, yeah, that's maintaining those relationships is extremely beneficial. Any other advice, suggestions, questions? Okay, so we've got it all solved, right? Everything's <laughs> gonna go perfectly well. <laughs> well, I guess that's it. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>